I was ready for another praise song after that one. I think I wasn't alone on that one, huh? Okay, let's take our, our Bibles this morning and turn to 1 Peter. First Peter, this morning we're going to look at pretty much park on one or two verses today because of the Lord's table, but um, we've been looking at the destiny of the Christian, which of course the whole section here is talking about salvation, and specifically pointing to the holiness of salvation. That is... Um, the whole section here that we've been looking at. And of course, we've already been uh, reminded that we are aliens and strangers on the earth. But while we're here, God's given us certain responsibilities uh, to be citizens of another kingdom, his kingdom, and to live differently in our life. So this whole section is really telling us how we ought to do that. And there's been exhortations. Actually, there's five exhortations. We've looked at three so far. Uh, and these exhortations are given for believers to be prepared in order that we would all be equipped what, whatever lies ahead of us, whatever hostilities, whatever sufferings uh, that we may face in this world, uh, we're to be prepared for it, and the way we get prepared is by learning the Scriptures. So far, we have been exhorted to uh, have a fixed hope. And of course, in verse number 13, it says, therefore, prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And to do that, when we do that, we're to do it for the purpose of sobriety in prayer and resisting the enemy. You have to be ready for those things. And then also, we already looked uh, at the other one, the other exhortation, the second one, and that would be the exhortation to live a holy life. We're to do that as obedient children. We have been giving a warning not to do what we used to do. In verse number 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours in your ignorance. And then we were commanded to be our... Uh, live within our new spiritual natures in verse 15 and 16, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior, so that action and conduct behavior part. And why do we do that? Because it is written, holy, uh, you shall be holy for I am holy. Our Lord is holy, expects us as children to live out that communicable attribute that comes from him. And why do we live out a holy life? Because we're in a new family. Uh, we have a heavenly father, and our heavenly father has a, a holy character to him, so therefore he is holy and calls his children to be holy. And of course, all that uh, mention of holiness includes the thought of approaching, approaching God. God is holy, and he must be approached in holy fear. The heavenly father uh, is not only a good and a loving parent, but he is a judge and demands our obedience. So the next exhortation we looked at was last time was we are exhorted to fear God, to fear God the Father. In verse 17, it says, if you address as Father the one who impartially judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves in fear. There, again, a, a behavior word, a conduct word, and where do we do that? During the time of your stay on earth. So the Lord's very aware, aware that when we, be, when we became Christians, he didn't take us to heaven right away. He left us here. And in leaving us here, he's given us work to do. So as believers address the Father as his children, they should never forget that he is an impartial judge, a holy one, and without, is, is without respect of persons judging each one according to their deeds. So when it comes to worship, we must keep in mind that our God is both a 
consuming fire and also a God of consuming love. They are both present when we worship God, and we need to keep that in mind. So when we do worship, we are to do it with reverence and awe. And it is a reverence and awe which makes us run to God, not run away from him. So keep in mind, this passage is pointing us really to a healthy kind of fear. Uh, It's not a fear, as I mentioned last week, of a slave. It's not a fear of just a creature to the creator, but it's a fear of reverential, it's a reverential fear of an obedient child who understands the gospel and wants to love his God and... um, It's an obedient child to a loving father. Our father's loving, and as that child understands that, he doesn't want to take God lightly. He doesn't want to take the Lord indifferently. He wants to be very respectful in his understanding and his approach to God. So having a high level of respect, care, and humility for God is included in us fearing the Lord. Christian uh, reverence rests upon the knowledge we have of God's holy character and the knowledge we have been given of God's plan of redemption. And so that is where we kind of left off. So, so far, each exhortation to fix our hope in the future on the revelation of Jesus Christ, to live a life of holiness, to fear God, all have been preparing us to understand our vertical relationship with our Lord, which is always first. True salvation changes our relationship with God because one's belief in Christ brings us into the family of God, which makes God our Father. So we discover in the Word of God that God's method to bring us from sin to holiness of life is first, to make us know that he loves his children. And because of their belief in Christ, their sins are blotted out. God's children's consciences have been purged from the guilt of sin by offering the offering of Jesus Christ. Therefore, we walk away knowing that we are washed, we are made clean with the blood of Jesus Christ. And now that we have been reconciled to God and born into the family of God, we desire to love him. We desire to serve him. True service for God must proceed at all, uh, should not proceed at all out of uh, a hope of reward or a fear of punishment, but only out of our love for God. So as we grow in holiness... Our affections for God become more inflamed towards him, and our love for the desires of the flesh and of the world grow less and less as we are inclined to love God more and more. That's what usually happens. So at this point, we are readied to do something we really never knew how to do before. We're to do something we never really knew how to do before, and that is as cleansed and purified people, the effects of our new growing vertical relationship with God now spills over into our horizontal relationship with others. You probably are asking, what is it? that we never really knew how to do before. Well, here it is. You and I really never knew how to genuinely love one another. That may come to you as a surprise, but you have to guess the next exhortation in Scripture, and it's this. We are exhorted to love one another. Look what it says in verse 22. It says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. Now, if, 
if we were able to love people in this way, we would have no need to be exhorted to love one another. For the most part, the love we had for others was driven by selfishness, sensuality, superstitions, social disorders, personal excesses flowing out of an evil, sinful heart. And yet we would call it love because we cared for someone here or there along the way because we had a passion to help people. But this portion of Scripture is describing for us what it looks like living as the new people of God. All things pass away, behold, all things become new. That's what the Scripture says. As children of God, we have new life in Christ. And there are, because of that, new patterns and new principles that we must learn, we must learn, and then live accordingly. So Christians are exhorted to love one another. And of course, that passage of Scripture, again, it says, since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for the sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. See, the question is, do we do that? And more so, do we know how to do that? So out of holiness is going to come this understanding of how to love people. Now, that means this new pattern, we have a new pattern of life, and this new pattern of life it's going to be characterized by ongoing inward purity. That's what comes first. In verse number 22, again, it says, since you have in obedience to the truth purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Now, I really must be honest with you that I really struggled with this passage of Scripture. When I first read it, I thought, oh, this is simple. Actually, not simple, but easier. Maybe this is not going to be. But then when I got into it, I said, man, I ran into two big problems. The first was because the scripture in verse number 22, it seems to have a reflexive sense to it. That we are called to do this, to purify ourselves. I didn't expect that. And then secondly, just the nature of this exhortation because we, we often think that we are doing it and even fairly good at it. However, we are not. We have to learn it from God. In other words, this, this love that he's talking about here is not a human love. It is a love that proceeds from God himself. In fact, it says in this scripture, now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. So again, we must look at how God loves before we can ever get a sense of how love looks on the human level. This is to love people, this passage of Scripture. Growing in purity is included in loving your brethren. It does make sense that if your heart, yes, I was, we were initially purified by God when we believed, but this is talking about something more than that. In fact, I had to look at other translations on if, if they had a trouble translating this passage of Scripture. So that's what I did. I looked up all the translations, and here they are. Let me just read them to you and how they're, they're a little different in word order. I just read you the one in the NAS. In, in the NRS, in the, the New Re Revised Standard Version, it says, now that you have purified your souls 
by your obedience to the truth. And then the NIV says, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth. In the ESV, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. And then the New King James Bible, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth. So the struggle I had was this, that is this talking about the time of purification when they were converted? Or is this talking about post-conversion growth in moral purity? Well, as I said just then, that there are two different ways to look at it. It could refer to a time of conversion. It could refer to the post-conversion growth in morality, or it can, could refer to both. But the stress is really on the second one. It could refer to their post-conversion growth in morality. In other words, you you become a Christian, and what do we need to grow in before we can actually genuinely love? It's got to be purity of heart. What's going on in our mind and our heart when we think about people? A trustworthy theologian such as uh, Wayne Grudem, he suggests several reasons for interpreting this as a reference to their post-conversion experience. He said, first of all, number one, the word obedience never clearly means initial saving faith. Secondly, Peter uses obedience in verses 2 of chapter 1 and verse 14 in reference to obedience in conduct and behavior. And then, of course, the word purify, when used figuratively elsewhere in the New Testament, it is used to moral cleansing subsequent to conversion. And then the context of The apostles' call to holiness in verse 15 suggests that the purifying obedience Peter has in view results from an active response to that call. Now, this all means that the way one obtains moral purity post-conversion is by obeying the truth. Of course, if the truth is given to us to transform the mind, then the it is going to transform our mind, our mind, emotion, will, and it's going to begin to purify us in the area of moral purity. How we handle our body, how we handle our thoughts regarding other people. The true way of pleasing God is obedience to the truth, not merely the gospel message, but the whole Christian block of teaching and doctrine and life, we're to obey all that. The result of such action on the believer's part is to obey the command to love one another. That means God's given us the command, and he's also given us the ability to carry out that command. But the ability to love one another did not happen before you became a Christian. It could not. In other words, Christians have a responsibility to take action in their own moral purity post-conversion, and this also supports our understanding of the doctrine of progressive sanctification or progressive holiness. We're becoming more and more like the Lord. We're growing more and more in holiness, and of course, here we'll be growing more and more in moral holiness. Purity. In fact, take your Bibles for a moment and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2 because he addresses this in that particular epistle where it says this in verse number 2. It says grace, this is 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 2. It says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, verse 4, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises 
so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. And then notice what he says in verse number five. Now for this very reason also, apply all diligence to, in your faith, supply moral excellence. And, and in moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse number 9 and 10, for he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Verse 10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So in that passage of Scripture, we get the sense that we are to practice moral purity. We're to add to what God's already doing in our life, of course, understanding it from Scripture. And I don't think it is a mistake that moral excellence in our passage comes first and love comes last. Maybe for this reason, the most, the most difficult thing to do as a believer is to learn to genuinely love people like God loves us. So all our assumptions about us doing it has to go out the window today. And we have to start from scratch. Because we must all admit we haven't been doing it correctly. See, the bottom line here from our passage of Scripture is purification is an ongoing state. The Lord's means of purging the souls of his people from the, from the love and power of sin, which is, of course, naturally in us, is their obedience to the truth, which consists of aiming at conformity to the precepts of the truth of purity and holiness. See, because, because God raised Christ from the dead and gave him great glory, your trust can be in God. Your faith can rest in God alone. And now you can really, really, genuinely have love for everyone. So we are able to carry out this command because we are cleansed and purified people and can live it out in our daily lives every day. In other words, we can genuinely love others because we have been cleansed from our selfishness our hatred, and other defilements of the heart, and that is also an ongoing process. We are daily being purified, but we are cooperating with that in our own life, examining ourselves honestly and seeing how we're doing in that area. So if you have been cleansed and purified, you will have your hope fixed on the revelation of Jesus Christ. You will, you will grow in holiness and godliness and moral excellence, and you will revere God, and you will mature in love for God and fellow believers. So if you are not cleansed and purified initially, there's no evidence of the former. There can be none if there's no conversion. So that means that considering this, we have a new pattern of life to live by, a life characterized by an by ongoing purity. Of course, that means also, too, that it's going to be a life committed to a growing love. That's going to be part of it, a life committed to a growing love. Now, as I just think about there for a moment, there, there must be an origin of where love comes from that the Bible's talking about, and there is, and of course, biblical love the origin of biblical love is, comes actually right from the trinity of God. Um, in, other, in other words, God the Father initiated this love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says this, In this is love, 
Not that we loved God, because we didn't, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So again, God's love, initiated by the Father, is active. What's the action in it? The Father plans salvation, sends Christ into the world as the only substitute for sinners. He gives his son as a gift to sinful humanity. He initiates that love. So this love is going to have a action to it. The second thing we know about this love is it's demonstrated by the Son himself. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, the Word of God says this, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children. And in verse 2 it says, And walk in love just as Christ also loved you. And what did he do? He gave himself up for us an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. So it's demonstrated by God the Son by giving himself up to be a sacrifice. We, in turn, are to be imitators of that love, sacrificial love. And then we know also it is poured out by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit pours out this love in our heart. In fact, Uh, Take your Bibles and turn to Romans chapter 5, verse number 5, because that's exactly what it says in that passage of Scripture. In Romans 5, 5, it says this, And hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit of God, through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So this love is poured out by God to us at conversion. We are to live this love because of the new birth. This love has, as we have seen, also a divine origin to it. See, the origin of this love comes from the the Trinity, the triunity of God in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, if you notice back in Peter, also in our text in verse number 22, there are terms that the Bible used describing this love. And of course, the terms are twofold in our passage, but we know that in the Greek language, there are actually three words for love. In our human, uh, I mean, our, in our English language, we pretty, have, pretty much have one word for love, and then we use a bunch of adjectives to describe what we're talking about. But in, in, in the Greek, it's not like that. It's, it's very clear what kind of love they're talking about at any given point in a passage of Scripture. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that there are biblical love has terms connected to it that describe how it looks. And the first one, of course, is the word eros. Uh, the word ordinarily used in classical Greek for love between the sexes, the love of sweethearts, the love of husbands for wife and wife for husband is one word that is used in, 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 of course, describing erotic things also, this particular word. And then secondly, there is the word phileo. This is a a, a broader word in the Greek, uh, generally used for love of friends, and also used for love of parents to children, children to parents. Also, a love for fellow citizens and for the state to which we belong. Many times we say, I love my country. It, this word would be used. It would be the word phileo. It would be used to describe that. But then there is the third word, and it's the word agape. Now, this is a higher type of love. It is a love that is all-absorbing, that completely dominates one's whole being. That's why when the Bible says in 1 John, God is love, that's it. That is a statement that describes the very character of God in one, three words. God is love. He is consumed by that characteristic and the other characteristics, of course, of God are included within that. 
In, it is a word in the New Testament to describe the deep abiding affection of God and Christ for each other within the Trinity and then also for us as children. Now, look at our passage again in verse number 22. Since you have in obedience to the truth, purify your souls for a sincere love of the brethren and then, of course, fervently loving one another from the heart. Now, you would look at that and say, well, I guess those, those are, the, are the, the two of the same kind of loves. But see, in the Greek, the two words for love, there's two words for love here. One is the first word is the word phileo, which means affection for a fellow believer or fellow members of the Christian community. And, of course, the second word where it connects the word fervent to it is the word agape. Of course, which means the deep affection of God and of God uh, and Christ and for each of his children. So he's calling us to have phileo love for the brethren, and also he's calling us to have agape love for the brethren. Now, don't forget that this passage of scripture, these exhortations are given to those who are living as aliens aliens on this earth, sojourners, and are in the midst of suffering. So we're, we're, we're the love even in the midst of that kind of circumstance. So we really can't have excuses to say we have no time to do this. We have no time for people. We have no time to carry out this admonition. See, love within the local church is vital because our new relationship with God has brought us into a new visible community of brothers and sisters. On the earthly level, we all come from different families with their different ethnic, racial, and social connections. However, on the spiritual level, we have a new identity. We are more than a community, we are more than a gathering of people. We are family in which we have the same Father. In the true church, love must be the dominating characteristic in, in our relationships. It must be. Of course, in verse number 22, we also have to describe the qualities of this love. And of course, the first one is it's to be a sincere love. And that means it's riddled with truth. It is a brotherly love that is honest and pure and unfouled and absent from carnal and worldly motives. That, now, so of course, remember, the purity Moral purity comes in on this right here, that if I don't have moral, moral purity going on in my heart, I can't really love people because I'm looking at them wrong. I'm treating them wrong. I'm categorizing them in my mind incorrectly. But a sincere love, this is the word, of course, connected with the word uh, phileo, Philadelphia, we have to have a sincere love for what? For the brethren. So it's talking about not loving everybody. It's talking about loving the people of God. It's talking about loving other Christians, other brothers and sisters in Christ, and to, and to love them in a way that in your heart, you're sincere. You are not hypocritical. You're not play acting. You're not just giving lip service to, to the person. You're actually truthful about it from your heart. And then the next word, it says that we are to love with fervent love. That's the word agape in this, this uh, part of the verse. This fervent love, this new love that we're given, uh, is given to us by God, by the Father, Son, and the Spirit, is a Christ-like sacrificial love. It is a love that stretches out and extends its efforts to the limits. See, God calls us to a love that is, is with all our strength. When we do give people love with all our strength, 
we will keep on forgiving them. We will find ways to settle privately the wrongs others do against us. We will reach out to people no matter how deeply they have fallen. We won't hold their past sins against them like a ball and chain connected to them, but we'll try to help them have a build a better future. See, that's what... In, this, in a small way, that's what fervent love is, the, the kind we owe our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's amazing the Apostle Paul at the end of the book of Romans, he says you do owe something to people. You know what you owe them? You owe them love. Because if it's Christians are the only ones who know how to do this, because they're given the power to do it, the ability to do it. See, we share... Brotherly love because we are all related to Christ. We share godly love because we belong to God. So this is another attribute of God that we can actually live out. But if you notice in verse number 22, it says something else. We're to love one another from the heart. That's really talking about the depth, the depth of love. It is a love out of a purified heart. Some translations use that word purified in this passage. It is to be a consistent, deeply felt love from a pure heart. Again, it's not somebody just acting on the stage. So we should get, you know, we, at this point what we get, I get the sense that this is something we have to work hard at. This is not something that just comes to us. This is not something we're born with. This is not some, something we can be taught uh, by other human beings unless they're believers. See, we have love in our heart, but we don't always manifest it fully. It's there. It's impossible to love the truth and hate the brethren. According to the epistle of 1 John, love of God is a necessary foundation to love others. So these are the loves that the Bible talks about. And of course, 1 John 4.11 tells us this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. I mean, all through 1 John, 1 John 3.14, we know that we have passed from death into life. Why? Because we love the brethren. In other words, there's life there. There's divine life that communicates divine love to people. The source of all love is God. God dwells in us, and God's love is perfected in us. So that means anyone claiming to know God, and failing to show love to other believers, it can only mean that person is a deceiver or is just plain old self-deceived. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 19 and 20, it says this, we love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It shows we are children of God, but if we lack love to God, we lack love to God's church. See, so the question has to come up, is how do we, how do you love your other brothers and sisters in Christ? How are we doing it? Possibly, uh, we can maybe gain a, 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 another level of understanding in this new love if we, if we place it against the works of the flesh. Perhaps the most striking quality of fleshly indulgences as over against love is that the works are spawned in selfishness. And quite clearly, 1 Corinthians 13 says, love seeks not its own, 
is not self-oriented, but rather other-oriented, in direct contrast the works of the flesh, particularly those of social disorders, are foundationally inspired by self-interest, which is usually behind a lot of things that we do. It's not about loving the people. It's about what I have on my agenda that I want to accomplish. So according to Jesus, in the Gospel of John, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment. It's all over Scripture. And what was it in John 13, verse 34? A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you love, if you have love for one another. That's how they know that you are my disciples. See, the world will know that Christians are indeed Christians and are intimately connected with Christ if you have love for one another. It was Francis Schaeffer who said, according to Jesus himself, the world has the right to decide whether we are true Christians and true disciples of Christ based on their view of your love for each other. So this is observable. This is observable among Christians, that you can actually see it. The world can argue with or easily dismiss observable love among professing Christians. There's something very attractive and beautiful about practicing observable love in the visible church. So if we, as a called-out group of believers, practice visible holiness, we will show forth the holiness of God. We would be sound in our practice of holiness. If we, as called, a called-out group of believers, practice visible love, we would show forth the love of God, and we would be sound in our practice of community. Because the Lord teaches this all over Scripture. You will know them by what? Their love. That's the, the characteristic amongst God's people. Do we have it? Is that something that we, we actually have? And I'm not getting at today on how that looks. I'm just getting at the very fact that we didn't have it before. And it's one of the most, it's the growing characteristic, characteristic of God that, that takes time and work to get there and to grow in it. We have it there in our heart. God's given it to us. It has to work out. The question raised by one man in regard to this, he said, how do you regard, he called it, your brother man? Do you regard your brother as negligible? That we make our plans without including them? We may live with the assumption that his need or her needs or his sorrows or her sorrows or his or her welfare and his or her, her salvation is nothing to do with us. That has to do with someone else. See, do we live as if in your world... No one matters except you. Or secondly, we may treat our brothers with contempt. We may treat them as a fool in comparison with other intellectual attainments and as one whose opinions are brushed aside. Others always look to you as less useful. Or we can treat our brothers as a nuisance. We regard our brother, those who are weaker, as less fortunate, underprivileged, or those in poverty or in sickness as mere nuisances. What are they doing here again? What do they want now? 
See, how do we look at people? If, if, we're, if we're doing these things, see, this is the stuff that needs to get out of our life. And then if ultimately, do we treat our brethren as enemies? You may regard all other brothers and sisters as potential competitors that we compete against, to be defeated, or therefore, ultimately, as a potential enemy. This is not a competition sport, Christianity. It is not. This is, this is a, a, a place that we are actually to live out this passage of Scripture in verse number 22. Since you have, in obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren, fervently love one another from the heart. This fervency that comes in is what drives this passage of Scripture. Now, in saying all that, I would say this, that we can love with this new love. And the reason why is because we have received the new divine nature. Christians have a new divine nature. The Holy Spirit indwells us and empowers us to carry out these imperatives. They're given by him, and he's given us the ability to carry them out. So the motive, and the ability to obey this command to love flows from the new birth and the new life that it opens up. In other words, the divine seed produces divine love to other people. Now, this morning I don't have time to go there, but that's exactly where the Scripture is going next. It's going right here that this principle of love is to be, this new life characteristic is characterized by the eternal in tension with the temporal. And that's what we have in the next section, verse 23 onwards. And I want to read that and then close, and I'll pick it up next week. Verse 23, 1 Peter chapter 1. For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word which was preached to you. And verse 1 and 2 of the next Therefore, putting aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness or the goodness of the Lord. See, that is what is behind us actually loving the brethren that we have a divine seed planted in our heart that brings out divine love in our life as we grow in Christ. Purity and love communicated through our lives to others. Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for the word of God. Lord, I, I must... Uh, say that the Word of God often brings deep conviction to our heart when we realize, Lord, we, we really have not gone very far in our sanctification when it comes to loving the brethren. So we have much work to do in this area in cooperating with your Spirit. We have work to do individually, and we have work to do corporately as a body. And I pray, Lord, that this would be one characteristic that if it is seen amongst us in its infant state, I pray that it would continue to grow and be manifested through our lives, through our speech, through our action, through our thoughts, through the purity of our heart, that, Lord, we would be concerned about other people and not just concerned about ourselves. 
And Lord, we know that in doing and thinking like this, it honors you, it pleases you. It is what you want us to live out. And so I pray, Lord, teach us. Teach us to be like this. Teach us to be like you, Lord. You loved us first. Now we're understanding how you did. Let us love others the same. And I pray this this morning in Christ's most precious and holy name. Amen.